Welcome back. Okay, today we're going to do chapter three, or lecture three, I'm sorry, and this is part one of two. And so we are going to start with what matter is and changes in matter. As a reminder, matter occupies space and has mass. An element is the simplest form of matter and cannot be further simplified. Make sure that you refer to your periodic table, which you should have on hand at any time while doing chemistry. A compound is two or more elements chemically combined, and I'll talk more about that in later lectures. A mixture is an intermingling of substances. There is no chemical bonding, and the individual parts can be separated by physical means in a mixture. Some of those physical means can include evaporation, magnetic fields, and others. Homogeneous mixtures are the same throughout, such as solutions or homogenized milk. Heterogeneous mixtures are non-uniform. This is like chocolate chips in a cookie. They would be heterogeneous, they're not even. Elements are the simplest kind of matter and cannot be broken down into simpler substances. Elements are composed of only one kind of atom. Compounds are substances that can be broken down by chemical means. When they are broken down, the pieces have completely different properties than the compound itself. For instance, when common salt is broken down, it breaks down into a metal that ignites under water, which is sodium, and a poisonous gas, which is chlorine, yet we can eat salt just fine. Compounds are made of molecules, which are two or more atoms that are stuck together. So when you're trying to determine if it's a compound or a mixture, take a look at this chart. If it's got one kind of molecule, it's a compound. If it's got more than one kind, it's a mixture. If you have to use chemical means to separate uh, the se substances, that's a compound. But if you only use physical means, that's a mixture. If there's only one kind, that's a compound. And with variable composition, it's a mixture. OK, on to states of matter. Solids are a form of matter that cannot flow and have a definite volume. Liquids have a definite volume, but take the shape of its container because it flows. Gases are substances without definite volume or shape and can flow, so they take the shape of their container as well. And vapors are substances that are currently a gas, but normally are a liquid or solid at room temperature, such as water vapor. Plasma is similar to gas in which some of the particles are ionized. It occurs at extremely high temperatures, but very low pressures. The electrons separate from the atomic nucleus, and it is actually the most common state of matter in the universe. We will not cover this state in high school chemistry, however, but you will see it, especially in astronomy. So if you need to check, you know, this is kind of a, a quick and handy dandy um, reference table for t uh, determining whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, and again, we're not covering plasma. This is kind of a flow chart to help you understand how the different states turn into one another. Um, sublimation is when a solid turns to a gas. Uh, deposition same, is the opposite. Melting and freezing you're familiar with, and condensation and evaporation you're also familiar with. So make sure you do understand that what sublimation and deposition mean in the terms of chemistry and states of matter changes. There are other states of matter. Um, these occur pretty much in the realm of theoretical and applied particle physics. So, so bear with me on these, because I'm going to explain what they are so you at least have some kind of knowledge about it. A Bose-Einstein condensate is a state of matter where a dilute gas of weakly interactive bosons are confined and cooled to near absolute zero. Bosons are weird subatomic particles that can occupy the same space at the same energy level. So in other words, they violate the laws of physics pretty much. Um, however, photons, which are packets of light, are a good example of bosons. At these conditions, a large portion of bosons occupy the lowest quantum state of potential, and then quantum effects can be seen on a macroscopic level. In other words, what's going on at the subatomic level we can actually see happening um, with our naked eye using Bose-Einstein condensates. Quantum superfluids focus on another type of subatomic particle, the fermion, that is a hard-to-get 
it to mesh with other subatomic particles. A superfluid phase can only exist in a supercold state, similar to the bones of Einstein condensate. And in that state, the fermions get together and begin to act as one particle and begin to flow in unison. This condition is something long sought after by physicists to produce a state at which no energy is lost when transferred. In other words, this is quantum superfluids are where they look at for superconductors. We haven't managed it, but that's where we're focused. Again, this is probably way more information than you want on random quantum physics, but I am including them so that you get some of the jokes in Big Bang Theory. Pressure can change solids to liquids in sub sub some substances. For example, it will turn liquids to solids such as in silly putty, under pressure. Increased pressure can also change gases to liquids, and this is how a compressor on a refrigerator in an air conditioning unit work. You do, one of the key points in um, chemistry is understanding whether it's a physical change or a chemical change occurring. So I'm going to talk about each one and you do need to know these so make sure you're taking really good notes. Physical properties do not change the substance. So a beaker is changed into a broken beaker. That's a physical change. Ice is changed into water and then into vapor. It's still water. Chemical properties change the atomic structure. Some of the properties that can be a substance is an oxidizer, an explosive, combustible, corrosive, acidic, or basic. If you see any of those words, that indicates that you're talking about chemical properties or chemical changes. Sometimes you're not sure what has actually happened when you do a process in the laboratory. And so some of the evidences for chemical changes can include the following, but don't, this isn't an all-inclusive list. If gas is produced, typically there's a chemical change, like bubbles. If you see bubbles coming out of solution, that's a chemical change. If heat is produced or absorbed, that's a chemical change. If light is produced or absorbed. If there is precipitation in a solution, that means that basically you mix two chemicals in a solution and a solid starts to come out of the solution. If electricity is produced or absorbed, that's a chemical change. If old substances are destroyed or new substances are produced, those are evidences of a chemical change. If water is formed where water didn't previously exist, that's a chemical change. If there's an explosion, which is a fast release of gases, that's also a chemical change. Or if there is a color or an odor change, those are all indicators that chemical changes have taken place. Okay, we're going to pick up with part two of this lecture in the next time. And I will see you soon.